Here's your host, Philip Goldberg. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for tuning into Spirit Matters. I'm very pleased that today's guest is another wise person, Swami Sarvapriyananda. He's been the minister and spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society of New York since uh, 2017. Prior to that, he served in various uh, capacities at the headquarters of the Ramakrishna Mission in India, outside of Kolkata, and as the assistant minister of the Vedanta Society of Southern California in Los Angeles. And for those who don't know, the Vedanta Society here and the Ramakrishna Mission in India are organizations founded by uh, Swami Vivekananda in the 1890s, and uh, that those lineages continue quite uh, actively in both India and the West. In recent years, uh, Swami Sarvapriyananda has become a widely known and highly regarded public speaker at a variety of platforms and has played a prominent role in various interfaith activities, including the World Parliament of Religions and the United Nations. If you uh, enter his name on YouTube, you'll, you'll get a great education on Vedanta and Indian philosophy and all other subjects related to spiritual development and uh, I, new ideas perhaps for you. Swami, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Phil, for having me in Spirit Matters. If I may start uh, with a personal question, I hope you don't mind. Uh, you joined the uh, Ramakrishna mission in 1994 and received sannyas, meaning you took monastic vows in, in 2004. Um, when did you discern uh, as a young man that this was your calling, that this was your your dharma, so to speak? And was it a, a difficult choice in, in any way? Well, um, I think it goes back to my childhood. Um, you know, I've had occasion to ask monks later on, when they decided to when they decided to become a monk and um, exactly the same question you're asking me and i always get two kinds of answers one is that um, they were in their teens maybe or a little later in the 20s and having completed their education maybe they were working or just finishing their studies and maybe they read a book or they came across some inspiring teacher or monk and suddenly they decided or something happened in their life and suddenly they decided to, to become a monk. Um, that's one kind. And that's maybe more are, are in that category. But there's also the other kind who always felt a pull, a spiritual pull since their childhood. And I think I belong to that category because as far back as I can remember, even when I was uh, you know, in grade school, I always used to think that I want, at first my aim was I wanted to become a pilot and fly aeroplanes like every little boy. But <laughs> there would always be the second uh, option would be find God, you know, the goals of life. Fly aeroplanes and number two would be fly, <laughs> find God. <laughs> and as I grew older, <clears throat> uh, uh, the priorities shifted. So the search for God. Yeah. I think it comes from the milieu where I grew up. My parents were devotees in the Ramakrishna mission and they used uh -huh. to go to the local ashram. And there were books of Vivekananda lying around in the house. And I was a bookworm. And this was way before um, internet, even the cable, cable to TV or whatever. So we, uh, we had to entertain ourselves with books. Um, and when I read Vivekananda, when he says straight away, the goal of human life is God realization. It is possible to experience God and that's the purpose of human life. Um, you transcend all suffering. You get what you want actually when you get God. It all resonated very deeply with me. And I thought, if this is true, then why do anything else? And this I thought long before I knew the details of monastic life. Huh. As I found out more about the ashram, about the monks, 
Uh, and somewhere along the line, I think by the time I was in college, I had firmly made up my mind that I'm not, I was going to seek God and be a monk, uh, seek God by being a monk. So when I finished my education, that was it. Uh, I had already long ago made up my mind. Uh, it was mm -hmm. not very difficult. I have somehow been blessed. Uh, there are those who go through a deep struggle. Mm -hmm. Very understandable because it's a huge shift in life. Um, but maybe because uh, this strain of thought had started in me when I was very young, I never had any serious conflict ever. So I always knew that um, finding God is the goal, the purpose of my life, and uh, being a monk is the best way to do it. And I was also blessed that there were no uh, obstacles. So that, you know, it, it was a fairly easy process for me to uh -huh. step away from everything and slide into a monastery and become a monk. No objections from your family? Oh, huge objections. Uh, <laughs> enormous objections. Lots and lots of drama. Uh, but that's, that's what you see uh, in uh, every, almost yeah. every family. There's a very few yeah. fortunate, yeah. Uh, you know, men, uh, young men and women whose uh, families, especially in India, which are, yeah. you know, where people are very child-centric. So if parents were devotees and they revered monks, but not my son. I said, right. Son, right. Let somebody else's son become a monk. But yeah. they uh, veered around eventually, <laughs> uh, and so yeah. Uh, you know, I you know, I I wrote a biography of uh, Swami Vivekananda's illustrious uh, uh, person who followed in his footsteps, Yogananda, and he had uh, you know it was very amusing reading about and writing you know the obstacles he faced because he too knew he was headed in that direction as a child really and. Uh, uh, you know, the family, they arranged marriages for him on three different occasions. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, I know our listeners are usually curious about how people find their calling in that way. Um, and most of our most of our listeners are probably familiar with what Vedanta is. Uh, but for those who are not, how would you describe the essence of what Vedanta philosophy is if you had to sort of sum, her up, sum it up in, in core principle? Well, straight away, I would use Vivekananda's words. Vedanta is um, the divinity within us, our own divine nature, and the oneness of all existence. Now, Vedanta, the word literally means the end of the Vedas or the final or the highest teachings of the Vedas. The Vedas being the, the foundational uh, scriptures, the most ancient scriptures of the Hindus, probably the most ancient existing spiritual literature in the world. In these v uh, Vedas, you find texts called the Upanishads, which uh, uh, contain spiritual and philosophical teachings, uh, mystical teachings also. And these teachings f form the basis of Vedanta. So literally, Vedanta, the textual part of Vedanta would be the Upanishads and the enormous amount of literature, commentarial literature, which has grown up around the Upanishads. So one book that is most popularly associated with Hinduism is the Bhagavad Gita. But the Bhagavad Gita is in itself a kind of commentary and exposition of the Upanishads. In fact, mm -hmm. Krishna uh, openly quotes uh, uh, mantras, uh, you know, verses from the Upanishads on different occasions in the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and another text called the Brahma Sutras, these form the, the triple basis of Vedanta. And then there's multiple layers of commentary, multiple schools which have grown up over thousands of years. The particular school which is very well known and which I belong to is called Advaita Vedanta, uh, which is the school started by or whose commentarial basis was laid by Adi Shankaracharya about 1400 years ago. Here, the idea is that uh, our real nature, who we really are, are not these creatures of flesh and blood, not mortal creatures which are born and fated to die in a, you know, a few years, but we are spiritual. We are spirits. We are uh, existence, consciousness, bliss in uh, Vedantic terms, Sat, Chit, Ananda. And the goal is to realize that. Once you realize that, the fulfillment of human life is attained. Um, that's the kernel of Vedanta. Again, to sum up in Vivekananda's words, the divinity within us and the oneness of all existence. 
Now, you alluded to this. Um, most people are familiar, if they are familiar with Vedanta, it's usually Advaita Vedanta, and they don't realize that there's other schools of Vedanta, um, especially, and, and, and that one of them is a, a dualistic one. Um, and how do, how do you explain those uh, different schools and how they relate to one another? In, in India, is, is there, among all the various lineages and everything, is there contentiousness about the different interpretations of Vedanta? Or are they simply understood as perhaps uh, three different ways of perceiving and describing the same reality? Right. Uh, it's true that Advaita Vedanta is uh, sort of prominent. Um, prominent, I think, more in the intellectual space, the mind space of uh, uh, people looking at Indian spirituality, uh, rather than on the ground. So, in India, on the ground, most people would tend to be devotional. Yes. You know, very few would speak about the impersonal, uh, pure being, pure consciousness, pure bliss. Most people would speak about uh, Rama and Krishna. And today, by the way, it's auspicious. Today is Ram Navami, the birthday of, of uh, Sri, Sri Ramchandra. <laughs> uh, just for listeners who, uh, because this is not live, it is uh, March 30th, 2023. <laughs> right. So most people would be devotional. They would be devotees of Rama or Krishna or God in one of the various forms worshipped in Hinduism as, as Vishnu, Narayana, Shiva, or the Divine Mother, Shakti, and so on. Um, why this happened was, I think, partly because in the late 19th century, early 19th century, late 19th century, when Europeans, the British, the Germans, and later on the Americans, like Emerson and Thoreau and all, when they began to discover Indian thought, they sort of naturally took to uh, Advaita Vedanta, which is probably, which probably for very good reasons, because it's the philosophically most appealing to the modern man, uh, which is one of the reasons why Swami Vivekananda stressed it uh, in his uh, teachings here in, in the West. That's another very big reason, because Swami Vivekananda also gave a lot of stress on Advaita Vedanta, the Advaitic non-dual interpretation of the Up Upanishads. So, and of course, our home tradition in our order, the Ramakrishna order and the Vedanta Society is Advaita Vedanta. What I teach is classical Advaita Vedanta, but inflected with the um, sort of more liberal understanding given to us by Ramakrishna Vivekananda. However, there are multiple, multiple schools of Vedanta. So just to run you through, you mentioned three. So often that's how it's presented that there is Advaita, the non-dual interpretation of Vedanta. There is Vishishta Advaita with the qualified monistic interpretation of Vedanta. And then there is Dvaita Vedanta, the dualistic interpretation. Uh, but there could be, there are many, many more. So there is the Shuddha Dvaita, there is the Dvaita Dvaita, there is the Achintya Bheda Bheda, which is, uh, uh, though it sounds esoteric, it's actually pretty common here in the United States. That is the philosophy of the you know, the, the Hare Krishnas, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, that's another school of Vedanta. Mm. Um, so all of these are, uh, our philosophies evolved from a set of texts. The Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, also in addition for the more dualistic texts, an important text would be the Bhagavata Purana, which deals mm. with the incarnations of Vishnu, especially of Sri Krishna. Um, Philosophically, as the central distinction would be this: um, the the traditional triad of sentient beings like us and all living beings, animals and plants. That's one vertex of the triangle. The other uh, vertex would be the world, the material world which we inhabit, the non-living world. And the third vertex of the triangle would be a god, the god of religion, god of a theistic uh, religion who is the creator, preserver, destroyer, who is omniscient, omnipotent, all-loving, good. So this is the traditional um, triangle in which religion operates, the theistic religion operates. Uh, now, the dualistic approach to 
uh, Vedanta would say, the dualistic schools would say, this is it. There is, we are all separate sentient beings inhabiting a world of difference, a material world separate from us which we inhabit. And there is a God who is separate from this, uh, who is an independent, who is the only independent reality. Uh, so God, sentient beings in sentient matter are separate realities and God is the supreme being controlling all of it. Very standard, um, you know, um, basic dualistic religion, uh, theistic religion. The other interpretation would be the qualified monistic or Vishishtadvaita, where it says, no, they are not separate. Actually, there is an organic unity. God is the one reality whose um, qualifications, adjuncts, or adjectives, you can say. Literally, it means adjectives. Vishishta means adjectival. Sentient beings and the material universe are parts of God. So there is a divine unity of the universe. The entire universe is one divine reality, which is God. And we and or the material world which we see around us, they are all parts of this divine reality. They're not separate from each other. So, but as, as parts, we are separate. It's like a human body, for example. And hands are separate from the feet and which is separate from the head or the tummy. But we are all one organic body. We constitute, so the universe constitutes the body of God, so to say. Now comes non-dual Vedanta, which denies this internal difference also. So there is no external difference, there is nothing apart from God. But within God also there is no difference. Uh, there is only one homogeneous existence consciousness place. And then in that case, the entire world of difference which we see around us, chairs and tables, quarks and quasars, you know, human beings and dogs and cats, all of these are mere appearance. At their root, at their base, is one homogeneous, undivided, un uh, undifferentiated existence consciousness bliss, this pure being, which you are. This is the central teaching of Advaita Vedanta, Tattvamasi, you are that, and the goal is to realize that. So these are different varieties of Vedanta and often when you look at Hinduism, you go to say Hindu temple and you see the bewildering array of rituals and colorful imagery, you know, behind it is usually some school of Vedanta or an allied school like um, Tantra or some, or, you know, some, some such school is there. Um, so Vedanta, would, I would say the various schools of Vedanta constitute the philosophy of Hinduism, Hinduism at large. Mm. Thank you. I have a linguistic question for you because you mentioned Vishishta Advaita. Um, I was just in India and one of the things we did was visit the cave outside of uh, Rishikesh that uh, was said to be where the great uh, ancient sage Vashishta lived. Um, and when I first heard the term Vishishta Advaita, I thought, oh, it must have something to do with him. But I'm not so sure. <laughs> so, no, no. So, Vashishta is just the name of the sage. And Vishishta just means, uh, it comes from the Sanskrit term Visheshana, which means adjective. Uh -huh. um, so, like a, you know, like a blue flower. So, the blue is, um, uh, is, the, is the adjective for, for flower. It's, it, what kind right. of flower is the blue flower? So, what kind of God? It's a God qualified by sentient beings and an insentient universe. Uh -huh. so, so, we are all, we are... You know, this is how they split it up in Sanskrit. Uh, Jiva Jagat Vishishta Brahma. Brahman qualified by Jiva, sentient beings, ah. Jagat, material universe. So, yeah, they don't want to erase the difference which is so obvious to all of us and say, yeah, they're yes. different. But so, uh, your hands and feet are different too, but that doesn't mean they're not part of a unity. So, we are all part of a divine unity with internal difference. Got it. Um, you mentioned uh, the three uh, textual sources of uh, Vedanta, um, one of them being the Bhagavad Gita, which is of all the uh, texts emanating from India would be the one most Americans are familiar with. The first Gita I ever read, uh, which had a big impact on me back a long time ago, <laughs> was the one uh, coming from your lineage, from the Vedanta Press in uh, California, uh, translated by Swami Prabhavananda, one of your illustrious predecessors. 
and the great novelist of Christopher Isherwood. And, and it was uh, singularly interesting because, or compelling, because you had the, uh, the insight and uh, wisdom of Swami Prabhupada and the skillful English prose of Christopher Isherwood. But it's always been very frustrating to me because they wrote it in a literary form without numbering the verses. And so you couldn't look things up easily. Now there's a new version, and I, I just wanted to let listeners know about this new version that uh, was painstakingly uh, edited so that the verse the text remains the same, but the verses are identified. Um, well, I, I, I don't know if I have a question for you, but I just wanted to announce that and, and tell, you know, that was an undertaking of your lineage. And I know it was rather painstaking. Uh, I'm sure you welcome it. That's true. Um, I think it just become more, a, a beautiful book has just become more useful now. Uh, so it was a very fruitful collaboration between Christopher Isherwood and Swami Prabhavanandaji, who was then the who was the founder of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. Um, so it's very well, poetic, language is very luminous, and gets the the spirit of the message across. And now they have been very careful to preserve the original work of you know Prabhavanandaji and Christopher Isherwood. The language is so beautiful. They just carefully inserted the um, verse numbers so that one can refer it back to um, the original verses. It just makes it more useful and yes. grounded in the original text. And I welcome it. Um, it's a great addition to um, our understanding. Speaking of the literature, uh, fewer people are familiar with the Upanishads and very few are familiar with Brahma Sutras. But if people wanted to um, delve into the Upanishads, there are many, many Upanishads. Where would you advise uh, uh, people to go as a good starting point? Uh, what, what are the more accessible Upanishads? I would say the best way to start with the Upanishads is to start with the Bhagavad Gita first. Take a ah. look at the Bhagavad Gita first, because the Bhagavad Gita is um, is uh, basically an exposition of the philosophy of the Upanishads by Krishna to Arjuna in a practical form, in a concise and practical form. You know, the question would be at the end of the Upanishads, so this is great, what do I do with it? And Krishna tells you what you do with it. He's talking <laughs> to uh, uh, Arjuna, who is um, very much yeah. a man of the world. He's a warrior in the midst of a great crisis. So... In the midst of the various crises of our life, how is Vedanta going to be useful to us? Vivekananda used to say Vedanta started off by being practical first and the philosophy next. Mm. So now, when you go back to the sources, even the source for Krishna is the Upanishads. Multiple Upanishads are there. Uh, there is an authoritative list of 108. There are more than uh, th that. But 108, you find a list in a Upanishad called Muktika Upanishad, you find there's a list of 108 Upanishads. But more practically and more uh, uh, relevant would be 10 Upanishads, uh, mainly because Shankaracharya, about 1400 years ago, he, he chose those 10 out of this vast body of literature to write commentaries and explain them. So we have a nice little Sanskrit verse which gives you the list of the 10 Upanishads to be studied. It goes like this. Isha ke na katha prashna munda mandukya titirihi aitareyam cha chandogyam brihad aranyakam tatha. So Isha Upanishad, Kena Upanishad, Katha Upanishad, um, Prashna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, uh, uh, Aitareya Upanishad, Taitiriya Upanishad. Chandogya and uh, Brihadharnyaka Upanishad. So these are the 10 major Upanishads. Major only because um, Shankaracharya wrote commentaries on that. And uh -huh. that's why we today call them major Upanishads. But there is also a whole range of other Upanishads. Yeah. 
Among those Upanishads, um, they are all famous for different reasons. I would say for ease of reading and of you know, uh, um, inspiring, and simple, straightforward, powerful, poetic, Katha Upanishad beats all the others. So the Katha Upanishad. Katha, for listeners, is spelled K-A-T-H-A. Right, Katha Upanishad. Um, so uh, there you find, like most of the Upanishads, they are in, in the form of dialogues between teacher and student. So in Katha Upanishad, there is a very nice story to begin with of the little boy Nachiketa, who goes to the house of death and asks him about the mystery of death. You know, what really happens after death? Is there something that survives death? And uh, the whole point is, what's our real nature then? We are, are we bodies that are born and they die? Or are we this immortal soul? And what's the nature of that soul? And uh, how do you come to know that? And how knowing that will set you free from suffering and give you fulfillment. So that's the Katha Upanishad. The dialogue between Yama, the lord of death, and the little boy Nachiketa. Very good. Thank you for that. Um... Let me ask you something that uh, I've noticed uh, perplexes or confuses uh, people sometimes, and that's the, the relationship between Vedanta, also of yoga, and um, what we call in the Hinduism, you know, as a religious category. Um, I often say, you know, Swami Vivekananda did not start the Hindu society started the Vedanta society, and he probably did that for good reasons. Um, one of the interesting things about the um, integration of the teachings from India into into the West and America in particular is you you find that people who take up Buddhist practices like Vipassana meditation. Uh, or study with a, 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 a Roshi or a, a Lama uh, or a Rinpoche, or who go on Buddhist retreats and so forth, uh, often don't hesitate to call themselves Buddhists. But there are millions of people like me whose primary spiritual orientation, if you look at how they think about their spirituality and what their practices are, um, are essentially Hindu, often more Hindu than people born into Hinduism, because they, they meditate regularly, they do yoga asanas, they go to kirtan and all that, uh, celebrate uh, Shivaratri or whatever, and but they don't call themselves Hindu. <laughs> Why is that? Is there something about the perception of what we call Hinduism? Yes, that's a good question. Um, well, first off, uh, straight off, the name Hinduism, it's not a name that was given to Hindus by Hindus. We did not choose to call ourselves Hindus. Uh, the old, the story goes at least that the Persians couldn't pronounce the name of the river Sindhu, which demarcated uh, India from, um, you know, the, the northern part of uh, Afghanistan and so um, it, what is now in Pakistan, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, the Persians pronounced it Hindu. And so all the people living on the eastern bank of the river Sindhu became Hindus, whoever lived there. And then the general term for the religious practices of the people who lived there became Hinduism. And the Hindus are happy with it also. The name, we, we don't, we have no quarrel with it. If you want to be more particular, finicky about it, when Hindus would, uh, we would call ourselves uh, uh, either Sanatana Dharma, the eternal religion, or um, or Vedantists. Vivekananda said that Vedantists would be a more uh, accurate term. Here, Vedanta, in a very broad sense, as the as the philosophy of Hinduism. So, or yogis, are, people would call themselves yogis. Yes, and that's perfectly all right. The word yoga uh, is an allied term. Uh, in this broadest sense, it means a path of spiritual practice. So all paths of spiritual practice in one sense are yogas. Um, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita, there are 18 chapters and each chapter is called a yoga. Mm -hmm. um, Swami Vivekananda famously, he classified all paths of spiritual practice 
under four yogas, the yoga of devotion to God, uh, the bhakti yoga, the yoga of spiritual inquiry, uh, you know, philosophical inquiry into the self, that is jnana yoga, path of knowledge. Then the yoga of selfless service, karma yoga, the yoga of meditation, dhyana yoga, raja yoga, he called it raja yoga. So these broadly four yogas, and if you look at a wide variety of practices in devotion, in meditation, but they can all be generally classified under these four. So yoga is a path of spiritual practice. Yoga is also uh, one of the schools of philosophy, of uh, orthodox Hindu philosophy. So like Vedanta is a school of uh, Hindu philosophy, which is predominant, uh, which has many sub-schools as we talked about. But yoga, Patanjali was the rishi who wrote the Yoga Sutras, the way of meditation which will take you to uh, enlightenment and freedom. So in a technical sense, yoga refers to the school of philosophy uh, of, um, of Patanjali, so yoga, yoga's philosophy. Uh, literally the word yoga has two meanings. One is the Sanskrit derivation of um, uh, Yujir Yoga to, to join uh, two things together. So for example, joining the sentient beings with God, Jivatma with Paramatma, that is yoga. All spiritual paths do that. The second uh, derivation would be Yuj Samadho, which means meditation. Yoga comes, the, the root meaning, etymological meaning of yoga is also meditation. So to call meditation yoga is perfectly all right. It's, it's very precise. Now what has also happened is that one of the streams of yoga was Hatha Yoga, which was meant to, which is body centric, meant to develop the body in a harmonious way. Uh, one main benefit being good health. Um, but the purpose was always to to be ready for you know meditation and to realize God or to become enlightened. That was the original purpose of Hatha Yoga. Over the last few decades, um, Hatha Yoga has become very popular across the world. Now we have an international day of yoga. But by stressing just two aspects of Hatha Yoga, which is the uh, asanas, the physical postures, and to some extent the breathing exercises, the pranayama, which are of course of immense value for, for health. Uh, but they are just like a couple of components which have been picked out of the whole system of, of Hatha Yoga. Uh, the all purposes of all these yogas was enlightenment or God realization. So that's yoga for you, that's Vedanta, and that's Hinduism. Now why would a um, large number of people have Hindu practices? You're absolutely right. I think one reason would be that Hinduism has, unlike Buddhism, Hinduism has never been a missionary religion, has never been a converting religion. I think until Vivekananda, Hinduism remained for large part for centuries, if not millennia, confined within the subcontinent of India. Um, it was more of an ethnic uh, set of religious practices. Mm -hmm. There were, in ancient times, we, have, we are getting more and more records of Hinduism spreading out to Southeast Asia. There have been huge Hindu temples, ruins found in Cambodia, for example, Hindu influences in China, in on the Shinto religion of Japan. So there's a lot that we don't know, really. And interactions between Hindu philosophers and the Greek philosophers, so there's a lot that we really don't know, but there are interesting little clues all around that Hinduism was more of a global phenomenon at one time, thousands of years back. But now certainly due to Vivekananda and all the teachers who followed him to, to America, um, Yogananda Paramahamsa being an illustrious uh, successor in that, in that line of teachers. So now again, it's, an, it's a worldwide uh, phenomenon. But the way it has come is not as a converting religion, but as a set of practices and ideas and ideals, which I think is very attractive to uh, the modern 20th and 21st century mentality. Uh, so that's why you see um, a widespread influence, a kind of hidden influence of uh, Hinduism throughout American and Western culture and the global culture now in forms of yoga practices, meditation practices. Um, uh, I would say, you know, somebody called Buddhism, then the extraordinary popularity of Buddhism, somebody called Buddhism export quality Hinduism. <laughs> you know, it was designed for export, but basically the ideas are all from the, the subcontinent. Uh, so that's why you see a spread of Hindu ideas, Hindu practices for people who would call themselves um, Christians, maybe Jews, maybe, or atheists, 
or spiritual but not religious or right. kind of new age spirituality so this is this is very common i think hindus are fine with it there there is a concern about new found concern about appropriation of hindu ideas and practices which is all very good it should be recognized the sources where has yoga come from where has ayurveda come from uh, where indeed a lot of practices which are now secularized like mindfulness which comes from buddhism and you can trace it back from buddhism back to the buddha's <laughs> own uh, yoga teachers who were uh, right, who, right. They would be called hindu yes we forget that the uh, buddha himself was born a hindu and was a quite quite an accomplished yogi yes absolutely <laughs> Uh, he, he himself talks about the teachers with whom he was not completely satisfied that's why he struck out on his own but definitely he learned a lot from them and if you look at what he seemed to have learned from them you'd see it was a kind of uh, patanjali yoga it was a kind of sankhya philosophy which he um, uh, learned from his teachers he had studied the existing teachings very deeply at that time yeah, yeah. thank you for that um Speaking of which, um, you've been very active in interfaith activities. Uh, it used to be many years ago uh, uh, that an interfaith gathering was essentially a priest, a minister, and a rabbi, uh, like the setup of a, of a joke uh, with, with a punchline. Uh, and frankly, I used to go to them, and, and, and I was often very bored. Uh, now they're much more diverse because of uh, immigration and just growing awareness. Um, how have you seen interfaith activities change? I know this in August, there's a Parliament of World Religions uh, coming again, another uh, iteration of the famous uh, Parliament of 1893, which we remember primarily because it's where Swami Vivekananda uh stole the show so to speak um I, and there's one coming up and and in my experience they've grown more diverse how have you seen uh the interfaith uh activities change and what do you see uh why are they of value right straight off let me answer the last one first why are they of value i think they're of immense value mm -hmm. one of the possible criticisms which I hear in the interfaith uh, meetings themselves, various kinds of interfaith meetings, uh, is that, well, you're preaching to the choir. Everybody who's participating in interfaith is basically moderate, liberal, uh, open to other faiths and friendly, uh, which is fine. I think there is a value to that. Uh, and the criticism is that what about those people who are fanatical or fundamentalist who say that my way or the highway they are not uh, hearing this message. They are not even interested in participating in such meetings. It's true, but it's also good for the choir to meet uh, some, some once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good for people who have goodwill. It's good for people who strongly believe in interfaith harmony and peace <coughs> to, to get together and reiterate that message and it, send it out strongly once in a while. And that has its, its deep value. It's very important for leaders of different religions to meet with each other. It creates trust. It creates a personal connect between the leaders. And so when they go back to their congregations and communities, they retain these connections. It's, um, it's, much, less, it's much more difficult to be hostile to somebody you are personally friendly with. On, on, on theological grounds, it's very difficult to fight with that. You can have disagreements and, deb and friendly debates. So there is a great value to, uh, to interfaith. Earlier, you had asked me a question which I didn't reply to. Uh, what about these various strands of Hinduism? Um, are they contentious? Uh, do, mm. they, uh, do they have problems with it? So if you see the, uh, the answer would be yes and no. If you see the three, 4,000 years of development of religion in uh, 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 India, in Indian history, you find one kind of contentiousness, which, uh, which I'll come to, but what you what is most observable when you look at it from the perspective of world history, is that um, the next to nothing, um, you know, the, the when it comes to bloodshed and warfare, organized violence in the name of religion, there have been little uh, fights here and there, but little, I would say, compared to what has happened in the West and especially in the Middle East, 
mm-hmm. and continues to happen. So that is something very remarkable, which has not yet been significantly explored. Vivekananda and Hindu leaders throughout the last century have believed this is one of the things that Hinduism can bring to the table and in interfaith conferences. Um, interfaith is not just a matter of theology and you know communal peace. It's a matter of national security, international security now. Um, so uh, there has been almost no violence, theological violence in the death. There has been there have been fights, but not on the basis of my religion is right, so I'm going to wipe you out or convert you or wipe you out. That did not happen until the late advent of um, um, Islamic forces uh, and then later from the, you know, the, when the European colonizers came to India. Notice that Christianity had come nearly 2000 years ago. You know, the, the story goes that the Apostle Thomas, Doubting Thomas, he came to India just after the lifetime of Jesus Christ. And so from that time onwards, there has been a continuous Christian community in India with uh, no problems at all um, uh, until the coming of the European colonizers who decided that you know these are uh, heretics or these are uh, un- polytheists and unbelievers and we have to convert them. Or uh, the Islamic invaders. Um, I- interestingly, Islam had come to India before the invaders almost during the lifetime of the prophet himself. Mm. There were traders coming from the Arabian Peninsula to the south of India. and the, In fact, one of the oldest mosques in the world uh, is uh, probably the second or third oldest mosque in the world was constructed in, in Kerala and I believe it continues to exist. Judaism has, there been, has, been, has been there in India for nearly 2000 years after the destruction of the second temple by, Roman, uh, by the Romans. Um, Zoroastrianism the majority community of, um, of Zoroastrians is actually the, uh, the bulk of them, which still exists, a tiny community, but many of them, they live in India. They're known as the Parsis or the Persians in the Parsis. So there has been a lot of um, almost natural harmony between extremely diverse um, sets of religious believers. You know, the belief systems are very diverse, but they never thought we would have to wipe each other out. And the reason for that, of course, is um, something very inherent in Hinduism, which is the truth is one, but the wise speak of it differently. This is, goes back all the way to the Vedas. Ekam sad vipra bahuda vadanti. So the wise are speaking about it differently. They're not unwise. They are wise and they are expressing it in different ways. So all those must be wise ways. And it's something in the blood of uh, all the Hindus. You know, they don't need to know Sanskrit or the Vedas. It just, they just very common part of um, day-to-day life. Now, um, Hinduism, in a way, came to the West in an interfaith event. The World Parliament of Religions in 1893 was this massive interfaith event as part of the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, and Vivekananda was part of it. Uh, that's how he came to, he rose to prominence uh, here in the West, and that was reflected back to India. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think in our order, we have been closely connected to interfaith work ever since. Mm. It goes back before Vivekananda. I must mention Sri Ramakrishna, yes, yes. the guru of Swami Vivekananda, who set him on this trajectory. Um, he, one of his central teachings was the harmony of religions. He would say in Bengali, Jato Mat Tato Path, as many um, faiths, so many paths. So he saw the different religions as not as contending forces, uh, but as different paths, all valid, they all work, they take you to the same divinity. Um, so there's no need to fight really. And it's really good that there are different paths. That makes it more glorious, more beautiful, more effective actually. Um, one more thing, just to complete the picture, what happened through thousands of years of Indian history was not just Hinduism, Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism, the three prominent religions of ancient times which survived down to today, they developed a common uh, forum, a procedure of debate called Vada in Sanskrit. So highly qualified people you know, who would be masters of their own uh, philosophies and of the op- uh, opposing philosophies, they would engage in scholarly debate, something like a scholarly gladiatorial c- combat, you know, trying to prove the, that they are right and trying to 
dis, you know, uh, disprove the contentions of the uh, opponents. And this is how philosophy developed. I don't think many were convinced either this way or that way. We, debate really doesn't do that. But it leads to the development of philosophy. So Indian philosophy really flowered in, you know, for example, a thousand years of debate between Hinduism and Buddhism. Here are two religions. Hinduism believes in an immortal soul. Buddhism says there is no such thing. Hinduism believes in a god. Buddhism says there is no such thing. And then they have this thousand year debate. What it resulted in was a very sophisticated philosophical development. So this is how contentiousness was handled in ancient India. Thank you for that. Uh, and I, I would add that in um, one of uh, Vivekananda's famous uh, speeches in Chicago in 1893, he hoped that the gathering would be the death knell of religious fanaticism. And uh, it hasn't quite turned out that way, but maybe the ongoing uh, efforts in the interfaith world will will eventually succeed at that. Uh, right. I mean, I just want to, um, you know, mention this. It's interesting, uncanny, that when Vivekananda said this, this was 11th September, 1893, 9-11. Yes. Yes. And the 9-11, 2001, right here in New York, where I'm sitting, uh, which was this devastating attack on New York by religiously inspired um, fanatics. Uh, so that continues to show, unfortunately, the relevance of what Vivekananda said more than 100 years ago. And even today, at the very beginning of the 21st century, it was marked by the fact that religion's intolerance is still a huge problem. Uh, and uh, the message of interfaith harmony is hugely relevant today. Thank you. One last question, if I may. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you uh, something that uh, was asked of me recently, and I'm not sure I answered it well. So I want to ask you, of all the, the uh, precepts and concepts that have come to us through what we think of as Hinduism, um, the, the, the the, car, the concept of karma has become widely uh, familiar to people in the West and uh, adopted, uh, not just uh, as a, a, a term uh, or, you know, a, 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 a language feature, but as um, a way of framing the events that occur to us and in the world. And the question that most people, if they struggle with the concept of karma at all, it's usually around inexplicable uh, events that seem to uh, involve the, the suffering of innocent people, such as um, natural disasters floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, etc., or <clears throat> the innocent bystanders uh, who end up refugees or casualties uh, in, in war zones. Um, it seems cavalier to say, well, it was their karma and therefore rooted in, in past actions and so forth. How do you understand that? How do you explain such things in the light of karmic law, so to speak? Yes. Um, the law of karma, if you state it outright, but let me back up a little bit. I come across this again and again here in the West. Yeah. The people struggling with the concept of karma, explain this to me, how does this work, why? Uh, and it's equally inexplicable to me why they struggle with it, because in India, nobody does. <laughs> if there is one thing that's common to very diverse schools of uh, Indian thought or philosophy, mm. all schools of Hinduism accept karma in, in spite of their enormous internal diversity. All schools of Buddhism and right. Jainism and Sikhism, the all schools of Indian thought, one thing that marks our Indian thought is a kind of what Karl Porter calls presupposition of Indian philosophy mm. is karma and then because of karma reincarnation the multiple mm. lives mm -hmm. now why would be why would this be such a given a non-issue 
because from at least from my perspective and from the indian perspective a belief in causality is is basically common sense in fact common sense and causality go together um, causes have uh, effects actions have consequences this seems to be a no brainer so karma is just an extension of that basic idea um that if there is causality in the external natural world is there causality in the in the moral world is there a reason why bad things happen is there a reason why good things happen nobody really asks for a reason when good things happen but we all want to know when bad things happen to us <laughs> uh and karma would say yes if you ask why there is an answer the very very question why implies uh, cause and effect you're asking for a cause of something that has happened so so that's it now um one need not interpret karma very um, you know in a very hair splitting way this little uh, an ant bit me um, so is it that i crushed an ant somewhere in my past lives and now an ant has come and bitten me or <laughs> well, they don't have to do that uh, the basic form in which karma is stated is vivekananda puts it very simply good good bad bad and none escape the law but whosoever wears the form wears the chain too so the idea is that we we are born with this body and you know this particular set of circumstances these parents in this country and this kind of health um and this is an effect of something that must have happened in the past um i mean in one sense it's literally true because science would say yes of course it's an effect and your parents and genetics and all of that but in a more moral sense that we are sentient being we have had past existences and now we have this existence and this existence has been conditioned by what we have done in the past this is the basic idea of law of karma uh, if we have been deliberately mischievous uh, there will be unpleasant consequences in this life we just don't remember we just can't collect it that's why it's not a natural law a natural law you can observe cause and effect together that's why it's part of religion there's a component of faith there that there must be some cause to this in the past um i think all human thought takes this into account even in the bible you see as you so so shall you reap um it's just mediated through god's will and punishment and reward from you know divine retribution and punishment that way um as far as the questions go why should there be mass calamity and um who knows karma is not just a, a personal thing you can't do a personal calculus it's a community thing if somebody dies it was it his fault not really it's not a question of um, of punishment and reward it's more a question of uh, causes set into motion in in some distant unknown past and giving rise to results now people find it fascinating this uh, karma the idea of karma is basically um, to make us more moral ma- make us better people it's not to be cavalier and to say oh that's their karma that's why they are suffering um, they deserve it that's a fatalistic way of interpreting karma and i'm not saying that people have not done that um mm-hmm. uh, you know there's this story about when swami vivekananda went back to india from the west a group of people they came to him for help and uh, they had organized a cow protection society so uh, hindus at least some of them are big on cow protection so cow protection society can you help us and vivekananda um, you know came down on them like a ton of bricks he says in your part of the country there is a famine and people are dying because of hunger oh, are you doing something to you know alleviate their suffering and their answer was oh but that's their karma ah <laughs> then, then vivekananda was furious he said if that's their karma then it's your karma to help them it's your karma to <laughs> to uh, help them and, they protested but the cow is our mother and vivekananda was equally sarcastic and he said yeah only uh, only uh, a, a cow can give birth to such wonderful <laughs> children uh, yeah so that's a fatalistic way of interpreting the law of karma vivekananda's preferred way of interpreting the law of karma was that all that we are now is what we have built in the past with all its good and bad and how we react to the present uh, is going to build a life for us in the years to come which is pretty much common sense i think Yeah, thank you for that. Uh I'm uh you've just given my ego a, a boost because I once said exactly the same thing to somebody who said, "Well, it's their karma." And I said, "Well, it's your karma 
you your karma will be based on what you do about exactly that person so i feel like i uh, i've been validated thank you it's my, also my uh, good karma and a great blessing in my life to be able to uh, have conversations like this with people like you and i i thank you for giving us the time today um and i look forward to uh seeing you in new york now that i live on the east coast and absolutely phil and, and keep doing this this is blessed work it's really really a very good karma thank you very much and listeners thank you for listening to us uh please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a show tell your friends about it and uh, email me with suggestions especially if you have any uh people to recommend that we interview and uh, check out my events and on my website and if you'd like subscribe to my mailing list and we'll see you next time with another wise and a wonderful guest thank you again swami thank you for